welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Good morning. Morning. There's nobody here, but <laughs> I say it anyway. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. This? My good morning, Lord cup. Nice. It's from a, this is from a music band that did a concept album based on my family's life. Really? Yeah, and this was one of their props huh. for their show. It was called Good Morning, Lord. And it was actually quite sympathetic. Hmm. Rare. <sighs> Welcome as you all come into the, to the house, house of worship. The digital and, sanctuary. Yeah, the sanctuary. Just follow your ushers to your preferred seat. Celebrities, first three rows. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Revolution. <sighs> what a day, what a day, what a day. Today is actually my mother's birthday. Today, she would have been 78 years old. So, birthdays when you lose someone is always a strange feeling. Um, but yeah, so, we always had good birthdays together. So yesterday I was completely frazzled from my week with the kids and I ended up getting a little spunky on Twitter. I don't know. I never learned my lesson. Eventually I'm going to learn my lesson and just not be on Twitter anymore. <laughs> I'm getting close. Um, I'm even debating on just getting rid of all everyone I followed, not because I don't like them. It's just because there's so much to see that maybe I would respond less if I just didn't follow anybody. I don't know. Pete does it. He follows Joel Olstein and that's it. So maybe that's a good self-care thing to do. We'll ask you a little later. Um, but yeah, so here we are. Revolution. Um, today, uh, I did, I did a, um, podcast well I didn't do a podcast I did a, a page I did a podcast for the what if project and this weekend I did a uh, meet with their patron supporters uh, they do a, a live meet with like a guest once a month you get to talk and ask questions to a guest that they've had and um, it's pretty cool you know um, Pretty, 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 it was a pretty cool thing to sit down and have, ask, you know, ask me questions and, you know, nothing was off the table and, you know, and it's with seven, it was about seven people. So it was really intimate and really cool. And, um, you know, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was really cool. And, and so today's talk was a wee bit inspired by, um, by that talk because I got such good questions that I thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll. Uh, I'll do some of those. Some of this is inspired between that and um, and some of the Mitra Congos. Some advice from the Mitra Congos. So I've taken the two and then boop. Nice. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw it all together, man. It's like a trail mix of spirituality, <laughs> <laughs> a veritable marketplace, <laughs> a cornucopia. Um. But I was going to talk today. What I'm going to talk about today is following your convictions and the struggle that that can have uh, in your life. We can have to str- follow our convictions. And when I say follow our convictions, I don't mean follow other people's convic- convictions, which seems to be the thing that's very big in society today. Is that we just go along with the, the mob because we don't want to be hurt by the mob or canceled by the mob, so we just. Oh yeah, that's bad. That's bad. This is bad now. Um, no, no, no. It's really following your convictions because sometimes you even have to speak against the mob or speak against the people who are on your own side or that you're with. Sometimes you have to speak out 
and there's an importance to that, but it's also really tough. And um, this will be a reminder to a lot of you folks, and this is what I was tweeting about that I think hurt, maybe not hurt people, but confuse people, is that I was kind of pushing back on the whole cancel culture thing. Um, but when you've been through it, through the church, especially in the 80s and 90s, but for me even in the 2000s, um, it leaves a different taste in your mouth. And I, and I was thinking about this. I was like, could I take it? Like, it's one thing to be canceled by the church, but could you be imagined being canceled by everybody? Like, the church and all the people and everything, everyone just, you're done. The only way I can see that being helpful is if there's restoration built within it. And if that's the, the idea. But if there's not restoration or healing built in it, then, I mean, you can be that way, that's fine, but it just, it's not one way. It wouldn't be something that would be a Christian ideal. That would be something of the Christian religion because the Christian religion is based on forgiveness and restoration and even love for enemies. All right, enough of the hot button issues. So following your convictions. So uh, I tried to write down some different things last night as I was working on my talk. And so I wanted to say, what was the most obvious thing that kind of inspired me to follow my convictions? And I'll tell you what it was. People. Um, people early in my life who, who really influenced me. And so I just started writing a list of people that I could think about. And uh, one person is, well, probably actually, is actually watching today. But, um, but my first one was my mom. Um, when I was very, very young, my mom wrote a book called I Gotta Be Me. And I remember some Christians even to this day were like, I don't know if that's very godly. I mean, aren't you supposed to die to yourself? Um, but she had this, she kind of had this attitude of just, she had to be who she was. She had to be. She just realized that she was who she was, and it was like the one thing that she could accept in this world. Um, even though she wore a lot of makeup, because I think she had insecurities about her, her appearance, which she was very beautiful without makeup. But, um, and I used to tell her that when I was little, like, Mommy, you're so beautiful. Um, but, you know, she was, her makeup was a big part of her, you know? It was her style, it was who she was, it, it, you know? And, and to me, I think that's what drew me to punk rock was the fact that seeing someone like my mom who was like, the image was as much as who she was and maybe told a truer story of who she was than even what you would see without it. You know, it was a statement. You know, she wore the jewelry on television. She wore the lipstick. She wore the crazy outfits. And she never toned it down for anybody. Even when she was made fun of. You think? I mean, I was thinking if people made fun of me all the time about like, oh, Jay's Captain hats are so silly, blah, blah, blah. And it happened all the time. Eventually, you'd just be like, oh, Jay's wearing a lot of baseball. <laughs> Jay's, Jay's completely given up hats. That's interesting. Um, you know? Um, but my mom was always this fighter, and this always got to be me. My dad said when she was, when they first started dating, that he nicknamed her the unsinkable Molly Brown, which is from a musical. But this fact that she was never. And I remember when she passed, my dad said, you know, it's just so hard for me, you know. To me, she's always the unsinkable Molly, Molly Brown. But she always fought, you know. She was always there. So I'd say that was that. And then my dad, as well, <sighs> seemed to always follow his convictions and do what he felt he should do. Now, he compromised times there, and I think he compromised with his theology. When you have to raise a million dollars every two days, that becomes a, a tough, tough thing to do. But he really, really pushed, you know, he really um, pushed the boundaries of Christian television, pushed the boundaries of what you're supposed to do, uh, mixing different music genres, and, and always like when Striper came to town, you know, went, took me and my sister to the bar and was like, I want you, everybody was saying, oh, these guys are hurting the church, they're satanic, you know, my dad went to, the, took us to the show, where they were actually playing with like some devil band. <laughs> You know, and put him in the hotel at Heritage USA, and we all hung out together. And, you know, I mean, he always was willing to believe in something new and take that chance. He saw something that would, saw something that he felt Christians were missing out on. And uh, it's so funny. He was like, I remember seeing this like 70s video of him in like a powder blue suit. And he's like, You don't have to be square to be a Christian. Christians don't have to be squares. You know, I was like, It was really funny. But at the time, I guess people were like, Dig it, man. <laughs> But my dad also was always very forgiving. 
always seemed to follow his convictions and say things and be willing to say things when, when it wasn't popular. Mm. And uh, I always dug that, you know. Now he says stuff that's not popular to me, and I don't dig that as much. But the point is, is they, they both taught me a lot about following my convictions. And that was literally within me by the time I was 10, 11, 12 years old, following my convictions was really put in me by my parents. And so I, I always hope that people remember that, you know, the work of my parents or the, 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 um, the, the legacy. legacy of my parents is not just all the weird bad stuff that happened or my dad becoming conservative and selling food buckets, but it's me. It's my sister. It's my kids. You know, that that's where the legacy lies because we have a lot of that common, that, that foundation from them. Amen. And um, they live on so, you. They yeah. Have, they have that afterlife through you. And yeah, your I mean, sister. I feel like I have like a combination of both my mom and my dad, and I'm really grateful to have both of those, um, especially now that I've gone to a lot of therapy. Um, okay, so then I said, okay, after that, who was it? And then I thought, who, who, who encouraged me to follow my convictions and one was one doesn't actually exist uh, Han Solo and as a kid I loved Han Solo and it was really cool because whenever me and my friends would play Star Wars everybody wanted to be Luke Skywalker but I wanted to be Han Solo and I think the idea was is that I wanted to be me like my mom in a way um, but I also wanted to do I wanted to be the rebel you know, I wanted to ask the questions, but I also knew that I wanted to follow my conscious. And what I loved it is like in the first Star Wars, you know, Han Solo takes off, says goodbye to everybody near the end, you know, and then Luke is trying to blow up the Death Star and then Darth Vader is like pew, right behind him and he's like, I've got you now, Skywalker. And then all of a sudden, boom, he starts to spin. But then what you realize is it's Han Solo decided to come back. And because Han Solo made that last minute decision to come back, he blows Death, Darth Vader into space. And he goes, let's blow this thing, Luke, and go home. You know, and I loved that. Here's somebody who can't even, can't escape their convictions. Mm. And so that mm. was another one as a kid that I just really loved. I think Batman was another one of just someone who took the death of his parents and was inspired to do good somehow from the, the horribleness that happened to him as a kid. So it's funny how even these cartoons and these fictional movies can set you on a direction of, of life. Um, so there you go. Uh, and so I tried to keep this as best I could in, in uh, order. Um, Steve Peterson, who's on, on here right now. Peters. What? Peters. Peters, sorry, I, I, I say everything wrong. Um, but, but one of the things was, is, is with Steve's when he came and was interviewed by my mom, I knew this was somebody who was was, was convicted uh, to do something. And even though it wasn't popular for him and it wasn't popular for my mom, these two people who disagreed came together for me and did something that the rest of the Christian world was saying wasn't supposed to happen. And um, I really honestly was surprised that my, my, my mom didn't get canceled. I don't know what they called it back then, or boycotted, I think is another word for it. Um, back then for that. And, um, and I can't imagine what Steve had to go through putting himself out publicly with being gay, a pastor, and AIDS. I mean, I just can't imagine what that must have been like in the 80s. But both of those folks inspired me, realizing that they're doing something that they're not supposed to do, but they both seem convicted enough to do something. And so that just stuck with me as I think nine or 10 years old, you know? Um, Another one would be this pastor, Phil Shaw, who was Assemblies of God pastor in Rochester, Minnesota. Now, we're talking about following your convictions, but I really feel like it's important to look at people in your life sometimes. And that's why I'm sharing it with you is I think we can all look at areas in our life of people. And maybe the story is the opposite. You are with people who didn't follow their convictions. But even looking at that can kind of help us re change the story mm -hmm. and maybe realize what, what we learned and maybe get away from learned behavior and even practice opposite action to that behavior. Um, but Phil Shaw, who was an Assemblies of God pastor who lived in Rochester, Minnesota, where my dad was in prison, he would always drive out, if we flew in, he would drive out to the airport and pick us up 
and take us to to see my dad or I could stay at his house and he helped me work on my dad's uh, par uh, parole <sighs> a sentence reduction and um, knowing that this wasn't a popular thing to do because there were not a lot of pastors coming to visit my dad when he was in prison especially assemblies of God pastors and my dad just continued uh, I mean, Phil Shaw just continued to be there for my family when it wasn't very popular and when a lot of people weren't showing up. And he would just go visit my dad every now and then. And that was always kind of this really beautiful, inspirational thing that made me think like, okay, I can't, I can't scapegoat Christians. I can't even scapegoat Assemblies of God pastors as much as I'd like to. Because here's an Assemblies of God pastor who's going out of his way to make sure that my family feels loved, that there's someone there for us on the ground, and he just was a servant. I mean, he just served us. I mean, he just made us feel like home and like maybe one of the family. I mean, I remember when working on my dad's case at night, I would go back to their place. We'd have dinner and I'd sit downstairs and me and his son would play video games like Mario Kart all, all night long, you know, and it was really cool. I was, I was really impressed by that and it stuck with me. Um, People like the Goodmans, the Happy Goodmans. You all know who Vestal Goodman is? She is a Southern gospel singer, and she was amazing, and her whole family were Southern gospel singers. But the Goodman family also stuck with my family during the darkest times, those first year, first year or two of, of, of the, the, the fall, and uh, just stuck with us and just loved us and took care of us, and I called Vestal Granny. So that was my grandma. It was the closest I ever really had to a real grandmother was Granny Goodman. And... Um, I remember her helping me get, you know, driving me and my, me and the me and my sister when the press was trying to figure out where my dad was, and she drove into a truck stop, and because the press was following us, CNN and a couple other press people were following us, and so she walks into this truck stop and she goes, "I'm Vessel Goodman. Do any of y'all know who I am?" And he's like, "I know who you are, this trucker. I know who you are." And she's like, "Listen, I got Jim and Tammy's kids in the car." And we got these press on our tail. We need some help to get these press, get these press off our tail. Any of you truckers want to help us? No, we'll help you. All of a sudden, man, it was like a scene out of like, like smoking the bandit. These <laughs> truckers come down. All of a sudden, they're blocking off the road, keeping these media people behind us. <laughs> and she just floors this. I think she, she had a sweet Mercedes. And she just floors this car. And me and her grandkids, we were just like, grow, Granny, go, go, you know? And it was just like smoking in the bandit. And, um, you know, in those moments of despair and darkness, you know, they could always find a laugh. We could always have a good time. I can remember her just singing, you know, my, right before my dad. You know, it was just the, the whole Goodman family, their, their sons and daughters and grandkids were just uh, really great and provided a lot of great. Now, now, I'm talking about following your convictions. I keep going back to this. But these were folks who could have made money just moving on to TBN or moving on to even singing for Jerry Falwell, which some of the folks did, which was really bizarre. Um, but no, they, they stuck with us, and they were going to be our friends no matter what their reputation was. And they also appreciated that my dad worked with them in the good times, and so they weren't just fair-weather friends. And I also think it spoke to the char character of who my parents were. You know, the cool thing was, is like Vestal hung out with like Johnny Cash and Elvis and all these other people, you know, and um, she was just, or, you know, the whole Goodman family were just the real deal. Um, and I'll try to make these shorter so we don't spend all day here. Um, Jesus, I'm trying to go in order. Jesus was another one. <laughs> this guy, Jesus, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, the fact that Jesus was constantly hanging out with people who didn't, weren't approved. You know, one of my favorite verses is where they're, you know, the Pharisees are going, you know, asking the guy, his disciples, why does your teacher hang out with such scum? Why does he hang out with these people? You know, and Jesus turns and says, it's not healthy people who need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call sinners, not those who think they're good enough. Yeah. And this constant, why, you know, even the disciples, why is Jesus talking to this woman at the well in the middle of the day? You know, this constant of following one's convictions. Um, you know, asking, uh, was it Pontius Pilate, you know, what is truth? You know, I mean, those, those type of things really stuck with me. Um, of course, uh, the great reformist, 
Martin Luther. Um, I feel like I had a very similar experiences with my conversion to grace, if you will, as, as Luther did. And seeing someone says, you know, I cannot recant, here I stand. Um, so Martin Luther, Paul the Apostle as well, you know, even defending himself amongst, I mean, we've gone through Paul enough to know why I like Paul, but I'm a very Paulinian guy. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, obviously was probably had the most direct effect from the books and from his teachings and from his videos, and I even have records and, and uh, you know, seeing Dr. King and how Dr. King loved his enemies and, and, and worked to, to, to care for them as just as he cared for the people he was fighting for and civil rights. The whole civil rights movement uh, was something to me that was just beautiful in, in the way that when you, when you can follow your convictions that far, even when people, you know, I mean, uh, you know, called Martin Luther King Uncle Tom and things like that because he did a nonviolence, you know, because he, he, cause he loved his enemies and things like that, and he still stood to his truth. Gandhi also, who inspired King as well, um, it, it, you know, standing up for what he believed Nonviolence again. Malcolm X, another huge, I mean, just a man who wasn't afraid to say things, even though he knew the consequences were going to be probably the end of his life and definitely the end of his career. Um, Johnny Cash, you know, the man in black, you know, the, he was always very kind to my family, but beyond that, he was, you know, I don't think people ever realize, like, Johnny Cash in San Quentin and Johnny Cash singing to prisoners was an idea that wasn't very popular at the beginning. You know, it was something like, you know, Christian folks aren't going to like this. You know, though you don't want this could be a career killer. But he had compassion for the people that most people don't have compassion for. And he took that. And now we're all praise him and think he's great for doing it, um, even though half of us might not do that. But these are people who encouraged me to to go beyond me, to see that there's a greater good sometimes, and to follow those convictions and those, compa those convictions, no matter what the cost, you know. Um, also, uh, just a few uh, honorable mentions. Uh, Mike Ness, um, who's the lead singer of Social Distortion, a lot of his music and stuff really encouraged me as a kid to just think differently and to be different, and uh, even to think about theology different. Um, Brian McLaren, Mike Iaconelli, great writer, uh, who always said avoid balance <laughs> at any cost. I always liked Mike, Mike Iaconelli. He wrote a book called Messy Spirituality. That's just really great. Um, Brian, Brendan Manning, I don't know, did I say Brendan Manning? He, he, um, his books on grace, I mean, the, the conviction that he followed of just writing grace and probably having four sermons about grace, and that's all he did for most of his life is preach these four talks maybe five, and um, encourage me to kind of move forward. I know we're, we spent 20 minutes just going over names, but oh well. I'm punk rock. I can do what I want. <laughs> and then another guy named Steve Brown, who is a Calvinist, but he wrote this book called When Being Good Isn't Good Enough. And uh, that book was the first book I've ever read all the, from front to back. It was the first book I ever read all the way through. And Calvinists write really good books about grace. It's just when you find out that the predestination, that they think some people are going to hell and some people aren't you know, supposed to or God created it that way, like has a plan for those people to burn, that's when it kind of becomes a shitty idea. But a lot of their sermons are really great at grace, and all I did was take his book and kind of try to open the door a little bit further. When I met Steve Brown, because he had a talk show, a radio show, this was probably before podcasts, but I remember when I... We got to meet and talk through that, and I remember he gave me his book, and I didn't even realize who he was, and he showed me his book, and I'm like, that's my favorite book. That's the book I've all read. I can't believe this is you. Um, but when, when I stood, when I made my stance on LGBTQ issues, Steve Brown uh, called me. No, I called Steve and said, listen, you know, one of my board members is pulling all of our finances, and he's leaving, and he's a Calvinist, and blah, 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 and I know that that's your thing, and blah. And he goes, listen, Jay, if you want me to talk to him, this isn't reason to leave. You know, he shouldn't leave over the, this. Be, this shouldn't be a, a, this type of issue. I'd be glad to speak to him. And just seeing the grace there of someone who we had disagreements on theology and things like that, but him following his own convictions to just even push against his own 
own sacred cows blew my mind. Um, Peggy Campolo, of course, uh, she was uh, definitely a huge part of my life, uh, getting me to be where I'm at to this day, but really got me to speak out. And Randy McCain, a uh, pastor in Little Rock, Arkansas, who was an openly gay pastor of a church in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, called Open Door Community Church. Um, the time he spent with me was just uh, undeniable. The time he spent with me just talking to me on the phone about when I was going through these ideas of what is okay, well, how do I become affirming, can I become affirming, is this something, and answering all the questions and having the, we, I would just sit on the phone for hours just pacing down around Atlanta, downtown, and just talking to him. And he just never, never missed, you know, no question was stupid or dumb. And now I say Randy is like my second dad. You know, I call, you know, Randy and Gary and their partners. I always say they're my gay dads, my two gay dads. Um, also honorable message mention, uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy. Um, I remember listening to a song called By the Time I Get to Arizona, and I remember hearing him say, neither party is mine, not the jackass or the elephant, and not understanding it at the time because I was going the way of the Democrat. And, but now, like almost a prophetic voice. And also the band NWA, which you know was super controversial because of their language and what they said, but knowing that they were doing their best to speak a harsh truth to the public and bring the reality of what was happening in South Central LA to young black youth and bringing that and tearing down walls and making us all uncomfortable. But they weren't making us comfortable. All they were doing was showing us truth, showing us what their lives were like and what life could, how horrible life could be. And, you know, that, those things inspired me. Another thing that, and this is funny because it's not as popular with the millennials, um, is U2, the band U2. Um, because hearing Bono say, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, even though he talked about Jesus in that song, blew my mind. But also, he has a song, uh, the U2 has a song called Acrobat, and I'm going to read it just for a second, but it goes, I would join the movement if there was one I could believe in. <clears throat> I would break bread and wine if there was a church I could receive in. And I just remember that hitting me as a, as a teenager. Um, that and, and, and like... Uh, songs like you ask me to enter he's talking about the church you ask me to enter but then you make me fall I can't be holding on to what you got you know and, and there was another one that said um, another lyric that really stuck with me was like um, Jesus never let me down Jesus always told me the score but they put Jesus in show business and now it's harder to get through the door mm. and these are just little things <laughs> that were just kind of clicking in my brain that's change. Wow. There needed to be a change. There needed something to happen. And just listening, you know, at the time, a lot of us emergent dudes were hearing the same thing, you know, like, oh, we're going to get radical with you too, you know, and now the kids don't like the Bono no more. <laughs> um, but those are the people. Um, also, I, I would often have to give one more mention to my buddy Stephen Shane Beckler, who was one of my best friends in high school, who was the first person to come out to me. And... I remember when he came out to me, I went home and I was crying and my mom asked me what's wrong and I said, Steven. She's like, what's wrong with Steven? I'm like, he's gay. And she's like, so? And I was like, what? And she's like, that's, there's nothing, you know, that's, that's okay. And I remember going, but Steven's gay, mom. She's like, yeah, but that, he's still Steven. And that just, all of a sudden my mind just went. And to say that that didn't have an effect on my career I would, would be a lie. I mean, yeah, it was just wow. so Steven's. And then Stephen reaching out to me saying, you know, I was really hurt when you turned your back on me because I was the same person. We had to have the hard conversation just as teenagers, you know. Neither one of us really prepared for life having that. Wow. So that was a really beautiful moment too. But so I'm getting there, guys, I promise. The ideas, okay, what were the ideas that have, have encouraged me to follow my convictions? Um... What are the ideas? And so I wrote down some of the ideas, some of the thoughts, some of the groups, some of the harder to pinpoint people. But um, Christianity, um, when I really discovered the concept of grace when I was 21, I think, uh, changed me forever. Um, punk changed me forever, the ideals of punk. And not just the ideals of the music, but when I was in high school, especially ninth grade, 
you know, there was a bunch of punk rock misfits. This was before Nirvana's album came out and kind of made us all cool again. Um, but, but there were all these punks and they always embraced me no matter what, you know, no matter what I went through, no matter what I struggled through, no matter, you know, we were always together. We were like a, a gang. It was funny because we didn't hang out much out of school. Like I hang out with the popular kids, you know, after, after school, but, but in school we were just all had hard home lives. You know, all had lives that were just not perfect and things are going on. And they always embraced me no matter how, like, no matter if I was like, hey, I'm listening to you too. I mean, they were all very happy when I started listening to Social Distortion, don't get me wrong. But we all just kind of became like family. And I remember thinking, I wish the church was this way. I wish Christians were this way. It was the same as these, like, all these early teenage 13, 14 year old punk rock kids. I wish I could experience this love in church. I wish I could experience this love in my own family. And um, so that was there. I think skateboarding is a very similar thing as, 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 uh, to that, but I think punk rock was even more so. Um, because it just didn't ever feel like there were cool kids. And skateboarding every now and then there's cool kids. But, um, but I just love I loved my punk rock friends, and uh, I don't know what happened to most of them, but you know, every now and then I'll see somebody online and we'll connect. But yeah, it was really a beautiful thing. Um, civil rights movement, which I mentioned before, but that was obviously a, a big thing. Um, the Reformation, understanding the ideals behind the Reformation. It was not perfect and it was violent, and there was a lot of things that, that were horrific about the Reformation. Um, but I think we do need Reformation again today. Yes. And I think the, the, the country needs reformation. I think politics needs reformation, not just the church. I think what we, we've got to realize is that the church isn't the only system that's broken. Most systems are broken, and especially the political system. Being in recovery also was one that really helped me live and accept myself for who I was and to love others and to be willing to make sacrifices for others, knowing that it would eventually help to my own sobriety. Um, and how you loved others in recovery. Um, the Jesus movement, when I was in, when I was in LA with my dad for about eight, nine months um, at this place called the Dream Center, um, I met a lot of the folks from the Jesus movement, you know, a bunch of old hippies, but they were all like Jesus movement people. And um, talking to them about the stories of what it was like to be a part of the Jesus movement and how they weren't accepted and how they were looked at differently. And they were kind of like, felt like they were schooling me because we were like punk rockers now and now we weren't the ones being accepted. And, um, but how they followed, you know, how they followed their truth, how they did something revolutionary, but also how they fell back into the machine and maybe not falling back into the machine again. Like, like yeah, we kind of all got caught up in it and got back, you know, it went from like, Chuck Smith saying, like, if you don't like hippies, if you're worried about the carpet, rip out the carpet, to the next thing of, like, you can't go into his church now and have a bottle of water. You know what I mean? So it was like, you know, beware of, of, of time and, and compromise. Um, I'd say the biggest thing was being a part of an American scandal with my family and seeing the scapegoating that takes place uh, amongst Christians and non-Christians, everybody scapegoats in their own way. Now, people go like, Jay, why do you have a hard time with cancel culture? I mean, I, it's strange to me that anybody over my age doesn't understand why. Because I saw it happen to my family first, firsthand, and maybe rightfully so. Uh, but the fact was is that I knew what it was like and how it affected my family, and I don't think there was a lot of positiveness out of that. Also, when you, when you know you're canceled, when there's no restor restorative justice, when there's no restoration in, in sight, there's no, you know, it, it's just, you're just done. And we were the mockery of the church and of the world. You know, I saw uh, uh, an interview with Bernadette Peters the other day where they were talking, about, talking to her about playing my mom and saying, how is it that you're going to play somebody who's such a, so ridiculed and just a joke, is just a joke to our country? How are you going to play someone like that? You know, and she was very, gave a really thoughtful answer. But the point was, is that was the opinion of America, of my family at that time. And seeing people scapegoat all religious leaders onto my family and seeing people just, oh, they're the bad ones, was something that woke me up in a way that nothing has ever done. Um, 
So definitely that, Christianity without forgiveness, Christianity without grace, experiencing that. Um, federal prison system, going through that with my dad. It's something else where you just realize the seriousness of life and how many people's lives are just taken away and lost. Uh, the media, how the media uh, just is very not great with facts <laughs> and not very compassionate and not worried about humans involved and, and things like that. So the it's media played in that. Yeah. And I think just being a teenager, I think we, we should listen to teenagers more because I think teenagers do have some pretty amazing experiences and and when you're a teenager, there's a passion there that we sometimes lose. And, um, and, and learn to not let that go. So yeah, those are the ideas. Those are the, those are the ideas that inspired me. Now, I'm going to say that these are the ideas that inspired me up until 2006, okay? So after that, I have a whole other list of people. But I didn't want to get that far into it because I thought we would just lead up into what these people put into my life, what these thoughts and ideas added to my life um, to get to 2006. Mm. Um, so in 2006 is around the time I started asking these questions about LGBTQ folks and, 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 and what it means to be gay in the church and if it's a sin to be gay or not. I'm just going to try to even use the language I was using at the time. LGBT, I think it was just LGBT at the time. I don't even think the Q had been added yet. Um, or gay and lesbian was a, a popular word. Yeah, gay and lesbian. Gay and, lesbian. Mm -hmm. and honestly, when I first, people were just saying gay. I mean, yeah. even lesbian wasn't even, right. you know. So, so it was like, you know, so I had a hashtag when I first started doing it. It was like, are you gay affirming, you know. Um, and they would, I remember when the LGBTQ thing kept going along, everybody was like, oh, the alphabet suit, we used to call it at the at Soul Force. Um, but I was also really understanding grace. I was also uh, becoming very liberal, and I was also probably a little bit more connected to the Democratic Party than I should have been, um, but I really believed in it, and sometimes I still believe in certain aspects of it. But this was where I was at that time. Um, but I was having to ask the big, this was the big conviction, if you will. You know, this is the big conviction for me up until this point in my life, it, it was to follow this through, was, can you be gay affirming? Can you be a Christian and not think it's a sin to be LGBTQIA plus? Um, was it a sin? So I want to say one of the things about following your convictions is that it's not always safe. And usually a really good conviction isn't safe. And also, one of the things I would say about following your convictions is not to have expectations. I think a lot of us look at our convictions and think, well, oh man, if I do this, this is, history will tell my story. People will know, you know? And that's not always the case. So, you know, don't, don't romanticize it. And I was lucky enough to live in a life where I didn't romanticize a lot of this stuff and I was able to understand what the costs would be. Um, so part of my process for following this conviction back in 2006 was studying the Bible because I thought it was the answer book at the time. I, it's not the answer book, I'm afraid. Um, there's some good stuff in there, and we have a lot of great conversations, and we come up with a lot of great questions and some answers, but it's not the answer book. It's not the direction book. It's not a law book. Um, but the big questions were Romans 1 was the biggest one. You know, Romans. The clobber scriptures. Yeah. And people always forget to read Romans 2. Oh, what horrible people I'm talking about. Well, you're just as bad. <laughs> but, but I had to look at Romans 1, and so I'm going to get a little bit into that only because we've had some questions um, about that. Maybe I'll do a special taping on, on the clobber passages if, if, if you'd like me to do that. That's great. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff. Soulforce.com or .org, I think, has a really great stuff on those verses as well. Um, I'm actually surprised that we're still having this conversation yeah, in 2021. For real. Um, but then again, I think back to 2006, and we didn't think that gay marriage would be legal for 20 years, and then it just all of a sudden became legal. So, uh, you know, it's funny when you're in time, how time kind of messes with your head. Um, 
but Romans 1 was one of the big ones. And, and after, I had to really get into it. I really had to get past the sixth grade understanding of Romans 1, like face value verse of the Bible, and research what the customs were in Rome. You know, it wasn't enough just to read the Greek and the Hebrew, but we had to understand what the customs were in Rome and what it meant to have sex with someone of the same gender because homosexuality was not a word that existed. Being gay wasn't a concept. Sexuality wasn't even a concept, really. And um, what it comes down to, Romans 1, is, is Paul is being very particular, if you read the rest of Romans 1, as he's talking about a very particular worship to very particular gods. And ironically, these were fertility gods. And these fertility gods, uh, you would worship by having sex with someone of the same gender or by making cakes shaped like genitals and placing them there or by sacrificing your firstborn to have more children. Um, strange, I know, but these were the things that Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about priests who were, were sodomizing young men um, as part of forms of worship and a part of just being business as usual. And, and these young men would lose any standing in the community because of this. So it, it's really dealing with more of unconsensual things and worship of idols. So I went in and studied that. And so for me, all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, Romans one, check that one off. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah really is, is, everybody's like, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? But there's a verse that actually later down that says Sodom was destroyed because it's how it treated its, its visitors how it treated strangers. And if you look back at the angel being wanting to be raped and stuff, you could actually think the word angel also means messenger. And any way you see it, it's about gang rape. It's not about two people who love each other. So those, seeing those verses and those other few that I'm not gonna get into right now, because usually it was mostly about worried about spilling of seed because the Jewish tradition was that they thought that semen had the life, had the life giving thing in it. And so they thought that spilling seed was the ultimate sin, which is, more along the lines of, um, like, Catholicism probably grasps that a little bit more. That's why they look down on masturbation mm -hmm. and, 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 and right. using safe sex and things like that because they think there's sacredness to the, the seed. Um, so, anyway, I explain that to say that those are the things that I was struggling with at the time. Um, and... Also friends and family and people I loved who are LGBTQ and speaking to them and, and having conversations with them as well. Um, but when I got to the point where I realized that this was not a black and white issue, this was not a sin issue for me, this was not, did not seem like a sin, I realized I had to speak out. And I was really nervous. And I was counting the cost because at this time I was making a really good living at speaking at churches all over the country and speaking at Christian festivals pretty much paid me for, like, was my year salary was, I mean, the festivals just took care of me. Um, but we also had really good income. We were getting really great uh, donations from, like, these, these groups that were giving just so much money. I couldn't believe it, you know? Like, we were just staff of seven. We were doing all this. And, and so I had to face a lot of that reality of knowing that these things might end. My career as I know it might end if I follow this conviction. But what I want to do today is not toot my own horn. What I want to do is to try to encourage you guys and say this is my experience of following my convictions and helping you follow your own convictions because I think we are in such a time where we're afraid to speak out. I mean, there's, I, it's so funny that I never thought I'd be more afraid of the, the, the church on the left than the church on the right. But right now I'm more afraid of the church on the left than I am of the right, honestly and saying the wrong things that I might get in trouble from them. And so it becomes a little bit harder to follow your convictions. Um, but I feel like we're just keep switching back and forth, like, oh, cancel's your thing. Okay, oh, we're going to ban books on this side. Oh, nope, no, it's our turn. We're going to ban books on this side because we're offended. You know I mean? It's like, guys, there's got to be a better way to do this, you know? Because um, we keep just kind of switching who's going to take the moral high ground. Uh, you know, every 20 years. Um, but for me, it was like counting the cost. But, you know, one of the things when you start getting to count, counting the cost, you start going like, oh, how much of this is a conviction this really is for me? Am I willing to put it all on the line? And I think when a real conviction comes in to your heart and into your life that you just can't deny, uh, I think that's when you just let go. You just let go of, of the cost. I just didn't care. 
I mean, I sat down with my wife at the time and said, listen, I just feel like this is what I have to do. You know, she's like, are you sure? And I just said, yeah, I just, she's like, but this could cost us. And I'm like, I know, but it's the right thing to do. And she's like, well, you've got to do what you've got to do. And I'm grateful for Amanda's support during that time. Really grateful for it. Um, you know, so you get to that point where you realize it's not about me unless it was a test of following what I thought was right or, or you know, at a cost, something like that, you know, but it, it wasn't about me. And I knew it was going to, you know, even when I was studying, I knew like, everybody's like, oh, you just wanted to tickle ears and you read what you wanted. But the thing for me is when I was reading those things, I was like, man, if I come to the conclusion that I feel is right, that's going to be, this is going to be a mess. And uh, I did. I did come to that conclusion. And, I, and instead of saying anything right away, I flew out to, to Arkansas and was with Randy and Peggy Campolo. And they had me speak at the church. And when I was speaking at the church to all the folks in the congregation is when it just said, you can't be silent anymore. You have to speak up. And I remember the, the, the Martin Luther King quote that said, it's not the words of our enemies we will remember, but the silence of our friends. You know, and that's why I don't like cancel culture, man. It's the silence of our friends, not the words of our enemies. You know, and when we're doing canceling, in a lot of ways, we're asking friends to cancel the friendships. We're asking people to cancel these things out. You know, and this is what scars and wounds people beyond restoration, and that frightens me. And it just doesn't seem like it's something that the Christian religion followers of Christ should embrace. It just doesn't seem to be there biblically. I, I know it's not popular to push against that right now, but it just doesn't seem like a system with hope. And Christianity, to me, seems to be a religion based on hope. Also death, also emptiness, also suffering. All those things come along with it. Don't get me wrong, sacrifice and following your convictions. But there's always hope for that, those person. There's always a hope for restoration. Um, so when I came back from Open Door Community Church, after I realized, talking to the congregation, I said, I can't be silent anymore. I went home, and I called an emergency board meeting, and I sat down with my board at Mary Max Tea Room in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was nervous as hell, and... Um, because I definitely knew where my, uh, my Calvinist, um, we had a Calvinist on our board. Um, I definitely knew where he was going to go with it. I, I knew what he thought, and I was just like, oh, this is going to be tough. And also he was connected to the big uh, donation we were getting every year um, from, this, from this family that had a, had, a, had a thing where they gave big donations to ministries that they believed in. And um, so I went in, I just sat down and said, listen, I've come to the conclusion through lots of study and through lots of conversations. I also had gotten invited to Exodus, and I knew I had to speak out if an, if, if, if an anti-gay group or, or a, what do they call that, reparative therapy ministry was asking me to come speak. I knew that I probably maybe have made the wrong, you know, maybe I wasn't being clear enough if they thought I was a good person to have. Um, so I went to my board and said, this is what's happening. I said, on Sunday... I've made this decision on Sunday. I'm going to announce to the congregation that I am gay affirming, that I do not believe it's a, a sin to be gay, and that anyone in, L, in the LGBTQ community is welcome to this church uh, to be staffed. To be, we already had a, 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 a gay guy on staff who was struggling with his sexuality, and the only reason he was struggling with it is because he wanted to. I remember telling him, like, listen, man, this, is a, this ball is in your court. I love you just the way you are. Mm -hmm. um, but he, was, he, he had actually left, left the church at that point, I think because um, because we were so okay with it that we were just kind of like it's just not this not a big issue to us, and went to a church where it was more of an issue, and that's another whole long story where I ended up talking with his pastor. Wow. But um, I told the, I told the board I said this is where I'm at, and the board was split. I remember D. E. Polk saying to the rest of the board like, "Listen, guys, if you signed up to be on this board, you've got to know that Jay Baker is controversial, and he's going to believe things that are, are are unique and different and 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 brave. You know, you guys need to know this is what you are getting into." And I really it was appreciated him saying that. But then my one board member, my my Calvinist friend, said, "Jay, if you do this, all the money's gone." That was the first thing he said. All the money's gone. And so I was like, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, and he goes, and I'm, I'm taking it with me, and I'm leaving. 
I'm done, blah, blah, blah. Now, I also knew that the board had the power at that point to vote me out. Like, if they wanted to just do a uni you know, unified vote, because I think it had to be all, everybody had to vote for me out to be out, but they could vote right then to have me out, but I knew that the board probably would be split. Uh, another one of my board members said, you know, I don't agree with you, but I'm going to stick with you. I don't agree with this, but I'm going to still be a part of the church, and I'm going to stay with you. I'm still going to support you guys. I, I, I don't know if I can agree with this ever, but I'm going to try and hear you out and hear your argument. You know, it's hard for me just because you're coming back from this thing and you've come to this conclusion. I just need to understand it more. We need to have a better conversation about it. Um, and then a couple are like, yeah, this is great, you know, but it was tough. And I said, well, I said, it doesn't matter what any of you guys say, I'm going on Sunday to do this. And that's what I did. I went on Sunday and I announced to the church that I was affirming and the church will be affirming from now on. And, um, and you know, and, I, and it's funny thing is, is during that time, I remember talking to both my mom and dad, two of the people who taught me how to follow my convictions. Maybe this is more of a testimony Sunday than it is how to do this, but uh, this is my experience, and I hope that you'll get something, some strength and hope from this experience, um, and that you see that these things are possible, and that pastors can do these things, but it does come at a quite a cost for pastors, and I do have to say, I was very hard on a lot of pastors when I first did this, um, but also I, I do realize that a lot of them have families and people they have to care for, and, and so... Um, and I just, you know, it's hard to follow your convictions, especially when it's, it's, it comes at a high cost. It is so hard. You know, I remember when, um, uh, who was it? Um, the pastor came out and said he didn't believe in hell. Carlton Pearson, you know, he had a mega church. I just had hundreds of people. He had thousands and thousands of people. And his church just fell apart because he said he didn't believe in hell. He thought everybody was included. So... So yeah, so I've seen people follow their convictions, but I remember sitting down with my mom and my mom just saying like, do you have to say it? And maybe you could just do it, you know? And just not say it. <laughs> and I said, mom, I, I've got to say it. You know, I'm like, I said, how many people do you think God spoke to? And this is how I thought back then. And I said, before, before Martin Luther King said, I'm going to say it, I'm going to stand it. You know, I'm not saying I'm the Martin Luther King of the gays. I'm not saying that <laughs> at all, LGBTQ folks. But what I'm saying was that was my thought was just like, if, what if people don't follow their convictions when they're hard? And she goes, honey, it, it's not that I don't want you to follow your convictions. She said, my worry is, is that the church is going to destroy you. And she goes, I know how horrible the church can be. And that's why I'm afraid that if you say this, the church is going to disown you and they're going to try to destroy you. And to me, when I hear cancel culture, uh, that's what I hear. I hear destroy you and disown you. Okay, so that's why I have an issue with it. Um, for me, everything has to have redemption in it. I'm sorry mm -hmm. if you don't like that, but that's just me as a punk rocker. So if you don't like redemption, um, you can look that up on what British things mean. Um, <laughs> so I said, well, Mom, I have to say it. And she goes, well... And she, I remember she, we were in Chick-fil-A, of all places, ironically, <laughs> where I'm telling my mother I'm going to become a for me. Yeah. And so she sits up, and she pulls herself together, and she goes, Well, son, I am proud that I have a son who follows his convictions, and Mama will be here for you. You know, so it was like, you know, me and my dad had a conversation, too, and my dad was like, you're judging people. <laughs> he thought I was doing, like, a negative judge, like, you're letting people off. So I guess that's still a judge. And um, we had about a, an hour-long conversation, and when I shut him down theologically, oh, he was frustrated. He was like, and he's like, let's just go do the show. And I'm like, you want me to be on the show after we just had this hard conversation? He's like, let's just go do the show. Let's just not talk about it anymore. Show must go on. You know, I was like, oh, so this is what it's like to beat my dad in a theological argument. It was pretty amazing. And I think he, uh, and then later when I left, because I was visiting him, when I left that visit, I said, dad, are you, are you mad at me? Are you angry at me? And he's like, son, I'm proud that I have a son that's willing to follow his convictions no matter what the cost is. And that's what he said to me. So people wonder why, why are you nice to your dad? Little moments. That's why. Tiny moments. So these people, and I told them both later, I've told my dad even to this last time I saw him, I said, you know all this is your fault, right? You and mom 
just told me to follow my convictions and told me to do it radically. So, and he said the same thing. He's like, son, the church is going to destroy you. He's like, you saw what they did to me. He's like, they're going to get you too. And then he said, you're going to crucify you, but I guess everyone needs to be crucified. I remember him saying that really clearly. Everyone needs to be crucified. Um, but man, my mom speaking at LGBTQ events, taking me to all these different gay churches when she would speak at them, doing book signings and gay bookstores. You know what I mean? Like, you you know, I was, uh, the early part of my teenage years and 20s, I was going to these things and I was like, I'm not sure what to think, but I'm here and these all seem like really great people and what's going on? Something doesn't make sense. So it was like, she was constantly just like, you know, planting these seeds in my head. Right. Um, talking to Randy McCain, going to Open Door Community Church, all those things were tough. Um, talk with the folks. Um, I think the... Um, so, I mean, the outcome of that was what I thought it would be. It was all the speaking engagements canceled, all the money taken away. And um, honestly, this, we're a DIY. Are we not DIY? We're as DIY as it gets. We are DIY as it gets. You're looking at the whole staff. Right here. And... All, all of our equipment. We do have a new computer that we finally got. We'd like to thank you all for donating yes. <laughs> in the car. But it, this is it, man. This is it. And um, so to follow your convictions, it is a cost. You know, it was, you know, I won some awards. The GLAD gave me an award, which I was, uh, it was like, not GLAD. It was uh, GLAD. I worked with GLAD, but um, PFLAG gave me an award for oh, yeah. being an ally. And that was huge. I mean, that was like made made my day. But the fact was, is that was great. I, I have an award in my house. I have a few awards in my house that were in a in my glass case um, that I'm proud of. But life goes on, you know. And now I'm at the point where I let my LGBTQ friends do the talking, you know. Um, I've stepped back because they have voices now. Um, and to give you, I'm going to just be real clear and honest here, is to give you an idea of how hard this still is. Is that I'm, I've never told this story publicly, but even when I went to um, speak at Wild Goose Festival and there was an issue with some of the leadership, uh, was, the Sojourners had, had done an ad that was, wouldn't run an ad that was gay friendly for one of the, the, the a denomination had a gay friendly ad and they wouldn't run it. And everybody was talking about it at this festival. And so it was like you're at this festival and there's this gigantic elephant under a rug that everybody just kind of walking around and whispering about and talking about but nobody wants to say anything so me being jay as i am i got up and said listen we're all talking about sojourners we're all talking about this ad we're all talking about lgbtq issues and i would be it would be wrong of me not to mention this and, and, and speak about it but i tried to talk about the great things that sojourners have done i mean revolution when we were making money we are actually tithing most a lot of our money to sojourners because we really liked the progressive way that they were doing things. Um, and so I spoke out. I don't even remember exactly what I said. I didn't think it was anything that offensive, but later I got pulled aside and told that I was being very hurtful. And then I kept getting pulled aside by other people. And, uh, you know, I thought we all had great conversations and worked it out. And then the next year when it came time to go back, one of my friends was like, yeah, the guy who books it told me that you're way too much trouble to uh, deal with, so they're not going to have you back anymore. You know, so it's not just one side that, that canceled it. It was it, it just, I've realized that a lot of people, a lot of Christians have a low threshold for being uncomfortable and for people who try to speak the truth uh, even when it's not popular or speak t to authority, especially when they're the authority being spoken to. And so, you know, so I, I was literally like, that was like my last festival I ever did. You know, I, and that used to be my life. My, like, my lifeblood, the church blood, how I met so many people, and it was just gone. You know, not even progressive Christian churches, and this was probably five years after that, or three or four years after that would have me. I'd say three years, probably. It was the first one, whatever that was. Um, which is great, though, because Sojourners and all those guys are affirming now, so I'm really stoked on that, and they would run that ad without even thinking about it. Um... I remember they said that I was like the Christian right of the left was one of the words that was used to my <laughs> face. Right like, you're just as bad as the Christian right. Now, that's what I'm saying now. is like, everybody's just as bad as the Christian right of the 80s and 70s. You know, so I'm doing the same thing, I guess. Conviction. Conviction time. Um, 
Well, gone an hour. Caleb loves a good hour sermon. Gives good time time to get some rest back there. Um, <laughs> I do love a good hour sermon. <laughs> um, I think the hard part, though, is to continue to have convictions, as we're talking about convictions. It's really hard to continue to have convictions and move forward and know that you might ruffle some more feathers when you're holding on by a string, you know? And it's sad to me that we're in the church where we all can have one big conviction, and then after that, it's like saying hard stuff, you know? Uh, it's so funny why I, I was thinking about the minimum wage and, and very upset that the minimum wage did not get raised. And, um, and especially from people from the party that I've spent my life with voted against it as well. Because I'm thinking, like, I've got two kids that I need to take care of, and we are literally shoestring away from being minimum wage workers. Caleb will probably have a minimum wage job soon just to help make ends meet. Yeah, I'm trying to get, I'm actively trying to get a... I mean, any job, we would prefer it to be more than minimum wage, but the point is, is like, these, this is the reality of when you think about the minimum wage raise. You know, it's not just kids. You know, it's people who are trying to do this who are trying to do passionate things that they love about, but also have to have jobs. I mean, if I hit one more bump in the road, that's going to be me, and this isn't going to exist anymore, yep. you know? Um, because I have to take care of my kids, and those are my number one priority. You guys will always be number two. Um, <laughs> or number three. Good number three. Um, Pete, you're number two, buddy. <laughs> number two. Um, but seriously... Um, so when you, you get to these points where you get start to, where the cost, now you're like, well, now I couldn't take in that type of cost anymore. And so it becomes, it, it becomes tougher a to, tougher thing to do, I think. And um, but what I've realized, too, from this is making room for others when they come through with their big convictions and hearing them out and listening, that when someone says something that's radically different, radically changes, and not saying, like, oh, we've got to get rid of you, or, oh, we've got to do this, or, oh, we've got to react. You know, saying, like, wait, let's just sit with this, you know? Let's not pull everything. Let's not take our toys and go home, you know? Let's listen, because the, there's going to be a time where an inclusion reaches out so far, and that Bible, Bible is based on inclusion. Jesus does this radical inclusion, and then the Apostle Paul goes and says, oh, nope, we're going to take everybody else. And so inclusion continues to build up through the Bible, and that's I right. think that's what we're supposed to do is continue to make yeah. the doors wider and wider and wider and wider. Yeah. You know, and there's going to become a time where the doors become so wide that even we won't be comfortable. And um, it's hard for us to imagine that because we think we're just awesome. Um, but there probably will come a time like that. Maybe a time like that when we have to start bringing in our conservative brothers and sisters who have said hurtful and hateful things. It's time to restore them. Maybe that's going to be the uncomfortable time for us. I don't know. I hope for that, though. Um, but it still wouldn't be great, you know, sitting down with Mark Driscoll and hanging out and having a slice of pizza would still be bizarre. Um, but it would be cool. Um, so following convictions is tough, um, and continuing to have convictions is tough. You know, you think it would be easier, like, oh, I did that, so I can do anything now. You know, but it's not always that easy. Um, so honestly, guys, just so you know, um, I honestly sometimes write out my convictions on Twitter, and then I'm like, nope, not putting that on there, but I do, you know what I do? As I save it for here. And I save it for you guys. And I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear your kickback. The first thing I want to hear is the congregation and what they have to say and what your two cents are on it before I go and throw it out other places. And so you guys have helped me with that a lot as well. But I just want to say is that I think it's vital that we follow our convictions. Mm. Um, I sleep well at night knowing that there was a time 15 or 16 years ago that I was able to do what I felt I needed to do. Mm. Um, and, and do it with very little fear and, uh, and accept the repercussions for what they were. A great thing was is you lose everything and then all the conservatives are telling you that all your conservative friends are like, you're just tickling ears. And I'm like, I'm tickling ears, but I'd rather be tickling wallets at this point. You know, I mean, it's like nothing's coming in. So, you know, whoever's ears I'm tickling don't seem to be making much yeah. money. Um, you know, so that was like, come on, you know, really? Like, this is what I'm trying to do to become popular? Um, so yeah, following your convictions is tough, but it can be done, and it can come at a cost, and it can come at a price. But the more people who do it, and that's one of the things I would do is when I reach out to Christian leaders asking them to be affirming and become allies, was 
the more people who do it, the more accepted it will become, the easier it will become for the next person and then the next person. And let's work together. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the church should have lots of room for disagreement. We should have a space for disagreement. Yeah. You know, there was a reason I had a, back in those days, I, that I had, had someone who was a Calvinist on my board. You know, I went to his Bible study. I knew we believed completely different things in a lot of ways. But there was a reason because I felt that there always needed to be room for different opinions and thoughts. There needed to be a diversity of thinking. And I wish the church had more of that. But what we do when we follow our convictions, sometimes we, we push, help push that diversity of thinking through. And, um, you know, I can literally say, I, I mean, I know 30 or 40 pastors that were just f were close to me who were not affirming, who are all now affirming now. You know, I'm not saying that was me, but what I'm saying is, is it's just as time went by, as people continue to speak up, as people follow their convictions and speak out loudly, you know, and it's not just about LGBTQ stuff, but it's about how we treat each other as the church, how we treat each other as, as how we treat our fallen ministers and our fallen people and, and people who make mistakes, how we treat our enemies in the church, how we treat their enemies to the church, you know? I mean, I mean, thank God for grace. If, we, if there wasn't grace, we wouldn't have the, uh, the Apostle Paul. Mm. You know, we wouldn't have the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was an enemy of the church and wanted to destroy it and have you and me killed. And then grace comes along, Jesus comes along, and then we have the Apostle Paul. Now, if that well, council culture would have existed at that point in time, there would have been zero room for the Apostle Paul. Yeah, we would not have the book of Galatians, no. and I would be just really stuck for things to talk about <laughs> at the beginning of the year. Anyhow, so we're going to just do the, we're going to do, uh, if you guys have any pushback or anything, we're going to do Afterglow right now. And um, thanks for listening today. Thanks for sticking with me today. I know it was a long one, um, but I really felt like it was important to talk about my experience with, with following convictions, this church's experience with following convictions, mm -hmm. and hopefully you found some sort of nugget that it will encourage you wherever you're at with your own convictions and, and help you to, to say what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even your conviction might come out and say, like, I don't believe in God 100%, you know? I mean, I've done that with a congregation that said, I don't know if I believe in God at all, you know? And I feel it inside, and I feel empty inside, and, you know, just even saying, like, I have doubt, you know? Or I have hurt, or, you know, I don't know. But those are the things. I'm sorry, I'm sweating up a storm because it's hot in here, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think it's the lights, too. Yeah, and we're wearing jackets. It was cold before we started recording. I really think it's the lights. Hot lights. The TV lights are hot. TV lights. <laughs> Life under the lights. Woo! <laughs> yeah, most of uh, what we got on Facebook thus far is just positive affirmations, thanking you for sharing such personal stories and kind of resonating with what you're saying uh, from all over the board. Um, something that stood out to me, Jay, that I just want to quickly say to you yeah. is, is that there seems to be a pattern uh, in your life before you kind of fully gave in to conviction or, or, or however you would word that, where it was like legalism versus the conviction. It's like, what was the name of your friend who came out to you? Stephen. Stephen. So with Stephen, you know, you, you had the legalism in your head saying, but that's wrong. You know, you know, you know <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's a bad thing. He can't be gay. And then you have the conviction or the grace of your mother uh, you yeah. know, that pulling you this way. So you have legalism pulling you this way. You have conviction or grace pulling you this way. And it's interesting that when you were you know, in your early 20s, when you decided to finally con confront like the clobber scriptures and all that, you approached it through the approach of legalism. Yeah, so I did. The, through legalism. But then conviction... And what and, and, and what your your heart probably wanted you you know to to definitely to, definitely to go did. towards definitely that, did. to to gravitate towards conviction and and grace pulled you and dragged you through legalism. Yeah. You said, said okay, you want to do this the legalistic way? We'll do it that way. Yeah. And it dragged wow, you through I didn't think it. Think about that. That's and it got good you, insight, man. Yeah, and it got you to to the point of grace and, and conviction that you are now. <laughs> Drag your conviction through legalism. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I guess that was, I, I was, I, you know, I think it was probably like, oh, these are what everyone, this is what the enemy, this is what the legalists are going to say. So I have to, I have to take it through legalism. Right. So weird that that's like, now I would just be like, oh, I don't care. Paul I know. Wrong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's just interesting to see those little, the, the battles between legalism and what wow. you say, grace or, or Yeah, no, that's, conviction. no. I mean, it's funny because even like back with Steve, you know, the legalism was, here I was doing acid 
every weekend and drinking and getting drunk and doing whatever I wanted to. But all of a sudden, this was the <laughs> this was the big thing. This yeah. is the wrong thing. Uh -huh. And and, um, and it took my Christian mother, who was preaching sermons every Sunday, to be like, "What's the big deal?" Yeah. No, that's amazing. And yeah, speaking of your mother, we have a lot of love here for her. Oh, thank you. Um, lots of lots of love. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, pretty much just just. I people. just want to just say our good friend Roy, Ray. I mean. Oh, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. It says. Fucking perspective, perspective, Caleb. Perceptive. Perceptive, Caleb. Damn good. All right, now it's gone. You can read it. You have to read oh, your own comp It's just really comment. complimenting me for my genius. Yeah, that's it. It was really good. But, thank you. Um, uh, fucking perceptive, Caleb. Damn good work there, mate. I love that. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate you too, Ray, and all your insights. I always love to hear from Ray. <laughs> I, love, I love hearing from Ray, not just because he's yeah. my ass right now. Yeah. Uh, Angel... Hey, Angel. Angel says, great to hear many of these stories that are, in effect, parallel to my own evolution of spirituality and faith deconstruction because many of them occurred as consequence of your uh, problem problemizations. Wow. That's why it's so important to be honest and transparent and outspoken about our process. Oh, uh, that's a really good point. That's really cool um, to hear. About your process is because uh, if, you keep, if you had kept silent... God knows where I would be right now. Oh, thank you. And yeah, Jay, you were a massive influence in, in me. And as, as a as a bisexual person, as a queer person, like you were the first pastor I'd ever heard, you know, saying oh. that that, uh, that you're even just saying that you're loved. Not even saying it's okay, but just saying, yeah. hey, you're here, you're loved, and period. Yeah, that was the that was the tightrope I walked a long time before I getting there. Is yelling at people like conservative Christian festivals that we have to love people, even gay people, even Democrats. Even gay. I remember Democrats and gays because I think Clinton was the president. We even have to pray for our president. Like, <laughs> right. You know, and everybody's like, that's great, Jay, you go. And now I'm now like, go to that Old Testament. Isn't it in the, in the Old Testament? Well, I guess in the New Testament, they're just give, given to Caesar what is Caesar's, but there's something about like God elects the authority. Yeah, yeah, that's in Romans. Oh, is that Romans? Unfortunately. Yep. I'll see if there's an Old Testament thing. But, the way. but, um, but yeah. Anyways, now, yeah, I think that's know. probably about it for... But six after months this. ago, I told people, you know, people prayed for the president and they got in trouble. So, interesting, right? Like Can't please everyone. Nope. We only pray for the ones we like, right? Is that how it works? <laughs> we should probably pray for the ones we don't like because that's actually what the Bible says. We should pray for those right. people. Anyway, well, thank you, everybody, for your feedback. I, I, I just wanted to share this story with you. Uh, I, I'd like to think at the What If Project... Uh, for inspiring this talk and, and for such good questions and all the folks on the Meet Your Congregation for, for asking me to tell a little bit about this story. Um, it's weird because you just don't want to be like, oh, look what I did, you know? But it's an experience and we share life experiences here and, and that's how we're family and community. So thanks a lot for, for, for being a part of this community. Uh, we love you guys and we will see you next Sunday. Bye-bye. We'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.